I'm Jeff Cable. I am a photographer. That sounds like one of those AA meetings. I'm Jeff, and I'm a photographer. And then you all say, "Hi, Jeff." <clears throat> uh, yeah, yeah. It is kind of a disease, and and, um, and, uh, and being here at B and H, like I need help. I, I drop my paycheck here all the time. Help. Uh, so uh, earlier today, uh, I was talking about event photography, which is one of my favorite things. And this is another favorite thing. This is a fun day because it's two, I get to talk and show images from two of my favorite things. And this is all about wildlife. And um, I am very lucky in that I get to travel uh, all over the world, not for the Olympics. I mean, I get to do the Olympics as well, but, but also get to travel and photograph things like wildlife, which is really exciting and fun. And um, we were actually at uh, Disneyland my daughter and I last week, and I wanted to take a picture on the jungle ride because I was going to say, like, unlike yeah. Disneyland, you never know what's going to happen when you're on safari. Like, you know, the hippo doesn't come up in the same spot every time, but we never did ride the ride, so I didn't get the picture. But what I'm going to talk about today is photographing wildlife in all aspects. Um, I realize that not everybody has the luxury of going to Africa once or twice a year uh, on safari, but uh, so I wanted to make this something that be, would be advantageous across, whether it's, you know, at home, actually I'll just take you there, um, whether it's, you know, around your house, local parks, national parks, zoos, animal parks, or if you're lucky enough to get to go anywhere. Um, and I'm going to go back for one second. Um, this uh, is sponsored by Tiffin. Um, I want to give a shout out to them because if it wasn't for them, I would not be here. Um, and Tiffin is the filters I use. I was saying earlier in the other presentation, in front of every one of my lenses, uh, I have the, um, the, you can tell I have the silver ring on the front. I actually like the silver. Some people don't. I love it because it reminds me if I do have a filter on there and I like to look at it and go, okay, good. Um, I use their HT filters, which I never, I used to say in the early days of photography when I started, don't use filters because I don't want you putting a subpar piece of glass in front of an amazing lens. Um, and then uh, Tiffin came out with these, which is the digital HT. It's a high transmission gl uh, glass or high transmission titanium multi-coated glass, which is their way of saying it's just really, really clear. Um, I'd never used any kind of UV filters until these came out. Uh, when I saw the clarity of these, it changed everything. And if you followed me at the Olympics in uh, Korea, the last Winter Games, and saw the image that I had of my filter that completely obliterated, um, it was a good thing that I had the UV on there because otherwise I would have been replacing the front element of a lens, which would be a lot more expensive than replacing a filter. So um, I do use uh, Tiffin filters. Uh, in front of all my lenses, especially when in places like Costa Rica, Tanzania, places where there's a lot of dust and, and harsh, harshness in the environment, which I want to keep off my lens. So I appreciate them for sponsoring. So moving forward, um, as I mentioned, photographing animals could be anything. And, and um, the first image that I put in here, I, I did for a reason, because this was literally, I live in the Bay Area, in San Francisco area, and we don't get wildlife in the Bay Area much. Um, you know, we have squirrels and stuff like that. But I don't know how these ducks ended up in my front yard because we don't get ducks, but this was literally taken, actually they'd walked over next door to my neighbor's house. And um, I got down low to the ground and I shot this and this is just the bush in front of their yard. But I took this and it was kind of a fun picture, but I, I put it in here because I, I want people to understand that you don't have to go on an African safari to take a nice picture of an animal, right? If you, if you know what you're doing, if you take it right, you can get a good picture anywhere. So, um, and it's not just, you know, front yard, I've, I've shot uh, images uh, you know, not just on land. This is in uh, Hawaii. Um, we just did one of the whale watching trips, one of the few things in Maui that's actually reasonably priced. You can go out for like a two hour trip for like 35 bucks or whatever it is. Um, every time we're in Maui, if it's during the whale season, we go out. So it's kind of fun to get that. And another thing to keep in mind is that, you know, uh, I do have very nice camera gear. We'll talk about that a little later. But this is taken with a point and shoot camera. Um, Many, many years ago, it's not the best photo in the world, um, but to me, it's one of my favorite images because I love dolphins, always been a favorite animal of mine. We were snorkeling uh, in Maui, and we saw the dorsal fins of a pod of dolphins, and we started swimming out to it, and as we swam out, they left. I was depressed. But then they turned around and came back into the cove, and we swam with them for about an hour. 
and this little baby was there, um, and you could tell that the one next to it must be hit by a prop or something, because the back end of its tail is cut. But it was one of the coolest experiences. As my daughter said when we got back to shore, Dad, you can now die and be happy. It was So it was more of the moment to me and the excitement of being there than the quality of the photo per se, because I've seen better images obviously of dolphins underwater, but this one means a lot to me just because I was able to get it. One of the great tricks to shooting good underwater shots is to stay close to the surface because the, the sun doesn't dissipate as quickly. So this, as you can tell, was very close to the surface. Um, this photo was taken in my backyard. I just happened to be sitting there. Uh, we, we have hummingbirds that come by once in a while, and I sat out there for about an hour. I'm a very impatient person, so I usually don't sit anywhere for an hour. But I just sat there for an hour and, and just fired off some photos. So um, it's not like you have to go around the world for it, although you can get some, well, I'll show you images of, of, from around the world. This is in Yellowstone, and this is driving down the main drive. Uh, and we saw a herd of these uh, of the sheep there and got some shots. And then to get more exotic, um, this is in Costa Rica in the rainforest, one of my favorite places to shoot. Um, every uh, twice a year we go and, and I teach there on the Osa Peninsula, which uh, if I remember correctly, National Geographic said it's one of the most um, a, like the, the grouping of amount of wildlife in one area and the varieties, there's almost nothing like it in the world. So they have everything from monkeys and sloths and you'll see a lot of the images in here. But these tree frogs are like literally about an inch in size. So you want a macro lens. But um, uh, before going to Costa Rica the first time, I went there and the only shot I wanted was the tree frog because I just love their eyes and it's so cool. Uh, and you know, then, as I mentioned, I get to go uh, to Tanzania and, and to Africa next month. We're in uh, Namibia and Botswana to shoot, and it's just awesome to see the animals in, in the real environment. And I can tell you that uh, after going to places like this, it's very difficult to go to a zoo because there's a different life in their eyes and a different personality to them that you don't see in a zoo that you do see in the wild. Um, and as I've explained many times in the, uh, when, I, when I've presented and I talk about this, each image has a story. So you'll see the image and, say, and see three elephants. And I remember sitting here waiting for the elephants as they're coming toward us. And, they were, and we kept moving our vehicle to try to get in front of them. And as they came, the three of them together, thinking how cool it was to get all three of them nice and close in one shot. <clears throat> so here's the thing. For those of you who are shooting in a zoo, or not in the wild. I always tell people to kind of compose tightly, um, a tight composition to avoid the distractions of the background. Um, I, I typically will shoot in a wide open aperture, and for those of you who are new to photography, that means the lower aperture number, like f2.8 or f4, something so that the focus is on the animal and not on the background or foreground. If you can get close to cages, get close to the cage. So if you put your lens very close to a cage, you can focus through it. I'll show you some images where I've done that. Um, obviously, don't do that if there's an animal with claws. Um, that would be a bad idea. When I shoot inside of zoos and things, I try to avoid walls um, or any man-made stuff if I can. Um, and some of the things you can't avoid are, are animals with tags on them. And this is true even in the wild. So in Tanzania on safari, there are some times you'll come across lions where they'll have a GPS tracking uh, collar on them. And that's the norm there because they do want to check their migration and that's fine. Um, I try to key in on the animals that don't have it. But as I said earlier, the job of the photographer is to tell a story. And part of that story is the fact that they track these animals. So I'm okay with that in certain cases. But this is like, a shot I did before I ever went on safari. This is at the San Francisco Zoo. And this is a, a shot, I liked the uh, baby that had just been born, and I kind of liked the, the shadow on the wall. But typically I would avoid this kind of shot because I really don't want to see all the man-made stuff behind him. And this is also at the zoo, and this is uh, a young pelican, um, or sorry, um, 
Flamingo. Flamingo, thank you. Um, with a tag on its leg. And you can see the other one, even the adult has a tag there. But it's very apparent. It's very in focus in, in your face there. But again, it tells you that, you know, you can tell by the environment that it's on man made land and so forth. So I typically would shoot lower and get closer to it to just get the head. And also true, this is taken um, through a fence. There's a. Um, in California, in Napa Valley area, there's a uh, place called Safari West where they try to simulate the kind of safari feel in California. And they have these animals. Now, if you stay back from the cage, this is what you get. So I'm focused on the animal, but the cage is, is there. If I move close to the cage, you can actually get a shot like this. And the reason is I'm shooting close enough that, and my aperture is wide open so that the animal is in focus and what's really close to the lens is so out of focus you don't see it. There are times if you look really closely, you can actually see somewhat of a grid. In this case, it's not very apparent at all, but you would not know that this and this were taken in the same place. So just by getting close to the cage or shooting at the right angles, which I'll show you in a second, you can actually get a nice shot. This is a shot in Alaska, and this is actually at a place where they uh, rehabilitate eagles. And the blue that's behind them was actually a piece of plywood that was painted blue. And then they had this like little shrubbery off to the side. So I actually positioned it and shot it so that the eagle, this is taken at F4, the eagle's in focus, the background is so out of focus you can't tell it's plywood, it kind of looks like a sky. And so it's a way of kind of faking it, or at least getting a nice shot of an eagle, even though it's in captivity and not showing that. Same thing here, I like this shot because I love the eyes. Although I'm, it's a, it, it looks a little sad to me with the expression. I still like the shot. That was taken at San Francisco Zoo and I positioned it so there were no distractions. It was strictly grass behind. But I still a nice shot of the eyes and decent light on them. Also taken in the zoo, again, really tight composition. You can't really tell if that's in the wild or not. So this was one of my favorite shots of an animal prior to going out in the wild. But it's a good look. A lot of times you can tell if they're um, in captivity or not based on how clean their coats are, um, you know, how brushed out they are, or a lot of times the claws of the animal will be ground down because they're on cement as opposed to having full claws. Um, so like I said, this was a favorite, as was this at one time. This was all also taken at the zoo. Um, so you can get shots um, at a zoo and get reasonably good photos. Um, one thing that people have told me, and I've tried this, um, some people frown on it, is whenever the, they get fed, they hear the guy coming with the food and he's got his keys to unlock the cage. So if you have keys and you dangle them, they will stop and look at you. Now, some people say that that's not fair to do, but it works, so. <laughs> this shot is still one of my favorites. This is taken in Costa Rica. Um, on my first trip there, uh, we didn't go to the Osa Peninsula, so I was just near San Jose, um, Costa Rica. And, and, and there's a place where they have um, wildlife in captivity. And this is a, a toucan that was actually in a cage. And I shot it with a 100 to 400 lens, the Canon 1 or 400, at 400 millimeters through a fence. And you cannot tell that there's a fence anywhere in front of that. And so I like the colors and the angle. And again, I was able to focus so tight, you can't see a foreground or background that's, that's, that's distracting. And that's important, having that aperture. And I put this in for Carol, because we talked before this, and I did not have a sloth in here, so it's in there now. And this also was in a rehabilitation area, and the sloth was above me. Was, I shot this at ISO 10,000, and didn't think it would be that great of a shot, and it turned out much better than I thought. Um, this is taken uh, with the 1DX Mark II, um, and, uh, and I really like it because the eyes are so well lit. But again, I kept it super tight so you can't see that it's actually in a cage. So I was in the cage with it, um, but so I didn't have to worry about any kind of grid. But, but I didn't want to see all the man-made stuff around it. So the, the leaves were put in there for it to eat, but I shot through them to make it look natural. Even in Tanzania, even when we're in the wild, I'll still shoot tight. So this shot here, um, these guys will come out and they're kind of scavengers. Now in many of the areas they're, they're very wild and they do what they're supposed to be doing. There are times when they 
um, certain areas, like when you enter the Serengeti, you have to stop and you have to do a bunch of paperwork. You have to make sure you lock your vehicles because they will go into your vehicles and take anything. On this particular trip, we lost a tube of toothpaste. Do you remember that? Um, some bags of chips. They will get in to like if your roof is open, your windows are open, they will get in. And one of our guys was actually in the vehicle when one of them went in. It was pretty funny. So this guy was actually sitting on the road. And so I got down really low, focused on the eyes, shot really tight. So you can't tell that he's on a, on a on pavement. Now, there's times when you want to include the environment, not exclude the environment. And so obviously, if you're in an area where you're out, where you're out in the wild, then I want to actually include the environment, which is interesting because my first... Uh, uh, safari I did, I tended to shoot tight because that's what I'm used to. I wanted to show the animal as close up as I could get. And then it wasn't until I got home that I realized that I actually liked my wider shots maybe even more than my tight shots. Because tight shots you could get maybe in a zoo or somewhere, but the wide shots show the environment. Um, and you can use your aperture to your advantage. You don't have to shoot wide open all the time. You can actually shoot at a narrower uh, aperture to show more of the background. The other thing I, you'll see in the photos that I really like is to look for patterns or synergy between the animals. So I'm gonna start with the zoo scenario. And this is the Sydney Zoo. Has anybody here been to the Sydney Zoo? It is unbelievable. The real estate is ridiculous because this is the view that the giraffes have. It's gotta be a very expensive zoo. Um, been there a couple times, but this, I, I sat there for about, I don't know, an hour waiting for giraffes to kind of frame the shot with the opera house in the background. So this zoo is so impressive, but it's, I wanted to show where these giraffes could see. So if I shot this at F4, you wouldn't even know what the background was. So again, here I was trying to shoot at F8, I didn't need the background perfectly in focus, but at least enough in focus to know where you are to the, tell that story. This, on the other hand, is a totally different shot because this is now in the wild. This is um, uh, in, in, uh, in the Serengeti, Tanzania. And it was what was amazing about this, being the first time I'd been there, is, is the amount of wildlife that would coexist. So right to our left, were about four or five lions. And I thought to myself, do these zebras know that these lions are so close? And they just tend to coexist because they're looking for water and, and they're migrating. And you can see in the distance the migration um, of the wildebeest and everything. But I had no idea that you'd have elephants and zebras and wildebeest and gazelle all together in one shot. So in this case, I want to show that. So I shot this wider, um, and again, I shot to include the background. I didn't necessarily need this at f16, because I don't need everything perfectly in focus. My subjects are still the elephant, but I wanted you to see where they are. If you'd shot this tight, or if I'd shot it tight, you would not know, maybe, that this is in the wild. You might think we're back at the zoo again. Um, on another trip, uh, there was this uh, a couple of elephants that were feeding off the acacia trees there. And again, I got some really tight shots of these guys, um, but I loved when I pulled back because the trees are a part of the story because it's the, what they're eating from. And I love the way the green of the trees helps to bring those elephants, you know, kind of frame them and, and kind of take your eye through the, through the image. And so again, I did shoot tight, but pulling back and, showing, and shooting wider worked. Here's another example of that. Um, it's very common in, uh, in Tanzania for the animals to get up to a high spot to look for prey. So here we had the, uh, these female lions that had um, gone up and were standing on this old dead tree and the fourth one below, I think it was a male below. And um, that's where you know, I wanted, I could have shot tight again, but I wanted to include the tree because it kind of, again, is a perfect way to kind of take you through that frame. And as a photographer, one of the things we want to keep our, in our minds all the time is, what are people going to be looking at when I'm taking this, when they look at this picture, and at where am I taking their eye in that frame? I talked earlier about synergy. Um, the, I had plenty of shots of these birds just one-on-one, -on -one, but I waited for these two they were eating, and I waited for them to crisscross like this and then shot this frame. So I kind of like that it's different and uh, it has a different look than just, okay, here's a bird. 
Synergy again, um, the patterns of this. Uh, I love the stripes on the zebras. This was actually um, them all coming down into the water. Literally right after this is where we saw a kill happen because uh, one of the wildebeest that you see on the side there had gone into the muddy water. One, there were a couple lionesses that were waiting. Um, and I'll show you, an Im I have one image of that to show you, but um, originally what I was going for here was to try to get the synergy of all those zebras head to head, coming down, looking down and drinking together, which I have some shots of and I like doing that. Didn't happen, but I love the mass of stripes here. And again, shooting this tight would have been a disservice. So I wanted to actually frame it wider. So. Um, I showed the slide in the last presentation and talked about the, the gear that I use. Um, I'm gonna tell you the subset of that of what I actually take on Safari with me. Um, I do take two cameras. I do take uh, the 1DX Mark II and a 5D Mark IV. Those are my two ca current camera bodies. So I do take two. And I always recommend on Safari, if you're gonna go somewhere far, even, you know, even if you're just going you know, cross country, if you're gonna shoot, um, two cameras is a good thing. Because if one does, one stops working, you want to have a backup. I had one, my 1DX Mark II uh, on the last trip. I got a dust spot I couldn't clean off of it right in the middle of the sensor, and so I switched over and shot almost everything with the 5D Mark IV. Um, I now bring a sensor cleaner with me, so I can clean not only my sensor but the people that go with us on the trip. Um, I did bring sensor cleaner to that one. I just didn't bring a good enough one because uh, that was a really nasty one right in the center. It was hard to get. Um, I did mention in the last presentation that one of the great things is Canon, who sponsors me, uh, does free loaners from CPS for anybody who goes on our trips. So if someone says, gee, I don't have a 100 to 400 lens or I don't have that camera, I'd like to try one, Canon will provide all the equipment for free if you go on the tour and you can use it for the whole trip and then return it when you're home, which is kind of cool. But the, the ones I use the most out of all of this, I bring one flash, not four. The lens, I generally bring either one, one long lens. Usually it's a Canon 100 to 400 because it's small, relatively, um, and easy to transport and does a great job, really sharp lens. If I want to uh, go big time, I'll take the 200 to 400, which is a bigger lens as a built-in teleadapter. I can flip a switch and go to 560 millimeters, which is kind of cool, but it's big and it's heavy. I don't bring a 70-200 because I rely on the 100-400 to 400 as my one long lens. And I either bring a 24-70 or a 24-105 to 105 with me. And that's my one wide. I generally keep a wide lens on one camera and a long lens on the other. Um, I do bring a 16-35, to 35, which is a you know, much wider lens. Rarely use it except for if I'm going to be doing night shots of the skies, things like that. I might use that lens. I don't bring a fisheye. Because one of the things you want to do if you're going to be traveling on safari things, you want to keep it light. So my one think tank bag that you see right here, that's the bag that goes with me, and that's it. That's all my camera gear. And then I have a carry-on bag for my clothes, and that's, that's what works the whole way through. I don't bring light stands and modifiers. Um, I do obviously bring Tiffin filters, both UV filters, as well as I bring circular, circular polarizing filter. So I love that for the getting the punch of the blue skies and the clouds. Um, and then uh, I do carry a travel tripod with the Acrotech head. I don't take the big tripod. I want one that's easy to travel with because really we're only using it for night shots and that's it. Um, I take one Think Tank bag and that's just the backpack. Black Rapid Strap, lots of memory cards, um, and actually a lot of memory cards because I try to keep everything on card if I can. I do bring some portable solid state drives and hard drives, not only for me to back up, but I also like to back up for all of our attendees in case and there's a hard drive crash that we don't lose our images. We do not want to lose our images. One of the cool things that I like to capture is the interaction between the animals. As I mentioned, it's nice to get a shot of one animal, but it's more interesting to get a shot of multiples. Um, sometimes it's the same species, sometimes it's multiple and complementary species, which I'll show you in a second. I love the infants at play and the trip to Tanzania January, February. You, you get that because that's where you have the infants. Um, as I, uh, someone was asking a question in the last presentation about the difference between January, February going to Africa versus like August. In January, February, you get the, the calving or the, a lot of the babies. 
which is cool because you get to see babies. You also do see more kills because that is easy prey for the lions and the, and the um, other animals. So you do see life and death. And interestingly enough, um, even of, of everybody we've had on our trip, there's some people you think that might be squeamish watching a kill, and that typically is not the case. People understand it's the circle of life and it's just what it is, and, and it is exciting to watch for what that's worth. Um, the maternal instinct is something that has always fascinated me. Um, how it's not just humans who care for our young, but how the animals do it is really something to watch. So here is uh, the mother zebra, uh, who looks pregnant, by the way, um, with a baby. And they, they tend to stand like that in opposite direction. That's how they look out for, um, to make sure they're not gonna be hunted. So a lot of times you'll see zebra and other animal that stand like that facing each direction. But I love how the, the baby kind of went up underneath mom. It's that, again, that telling a story and that feeling that I love. This just made me laugh. Um, <laughs> because taking a little ride um, and looking right at us, I love that. Um, one of the things, obviously, that's very important when shooting, again, doesn't matter where you're shooting, could be your dog in the backyard, is what direction is that sun? This was late in the day. We had just finished the safari for the, for the day. It was in the evening. This was probably a couple hundred yards from our camp. And uh, we saw a pack of these guys go by uh, with on this one on the back and got the shot. And it was very, you could tell by the, how warm the light is. It was the last bit of sunlight. But I love how that sunlight got right in the eye of the baby. And this trip, um, it was kind of funny because th this uh, lioness with her cubs, they were coming right toward us. We were driving down. This is in Ngorogoro Crater. And we stopped. And they came kind of right toward us. And what's interesting is the guides make such a huge difference because the guide knew to move to a position where the, they were in good light. The minute they crossed and went to the other side of the vehicle, all the good light was gone and they were in a shade and we lost that. But here we had nice light right into their faces. But I love the little cubs in comparison to the size of the mom. Two baby giraffes um, and actually one of these, and I think I have another shot later, um, one of the babies had just been born and it still had the umbilical cord, which was about probably two or three feet long that was hanging from it, which is really exciting to see. This is another good example of shooting wide to show the trees in the background and the grass. It was interesting because uh, the trip in 2016, we, it was a very wet trip and there was lots of water. And in 2017, it was a drought. And so you see the drought here. It's a much drier environment than we had the year before. That hurts looking at it. Um, but great interaction between the baby and mom. It made me laugh when I saw that. And the nice thing is you can get out of the vehicles in some places. This is by where a lunch spot was and they were just sitting there. Um, this is another shot. Uh, which is funny because it made me laugh because it's kind of like, ouch, except it was just uh, mom yawning, uh, but still pretty funny as a story. I love that. This particular um, kill, the mother, which is in the background there, the cheetah, um, had killed not only a um, gazelle, but its baby. And so it had fed the baby to its cubs, and these, these cubs were very well very nourished. The mom was doing a great job of keeping them fed. So she went over and brought them the baby, which they're eating there. And she had another, the mom, she had the mother of the baby off to the side, which she then waited for them to finish eating and then brought it over and dropped it off for the cubs to eat. And it was interesting. Again, it's hard to see if you're not, you know, if you're squeamish and not used to seeing blood and guts and things. But if you understand the synergy of it all, it is fascinating to watch. And I shot video of this because it was so incredible to watch mom 50 feet away just waiting for the cubs. And she'd walk over, check to see how they're doing, and walk back and guard the kill that she had. Another interaction between baby and mom, really cool. But it's not just the same species. Here's a case where you've got the oxpecker, uh, you know, that these guys live 
This is their environment and their home. They go into their ears and clean them, and they go in their noses, and they're all over. So a lot of times you'll see um, one of the bison, and, or whatever, and, you, and you'll see numerous birds either on their back or coming around on the side or coming out of their ears. And that's actually quite common. But before I went on my first safari, I thought, what is the luck and the odds of getting this bird on this animal? And it actually is quite common. You see it a lot. This is still one of my favorite uh, safari photos that I've ever taken. And again, it is the, it is the combination of having the adults and the baby that um, on our first trip to Tanzania, we probably saw maybe 10 or 12 elephants total. On the second trip, I think we saw three or 400. And this is one of the advantages of going on safari multiple times is you just never know what you're gonna see. And so we saw a lot more elephant. But I love, what I love about the shot, and this was nothing I planned at all, but it was the fact that the baby has such lighter skin compared to the adults so that it stands out. So that you have all this darker, more mature elephants, and then the light gray at the bottom, and, and still in sunlight. It wasn't in the shade of the others. So I really love that that stands out the way it does. Um, it was our last day on safari. Um, the wildebeest, which the wildebeest are some of the dumbest animals you've ever seen in your life. Uh, easy prey, unfortunately. Um, and you see literally tens of thousands of them. The first time we see wildebeest, it's really fun to watch all our workshop attendees go, oh my gosh, a wildebeest. And by day three, they're like, okay, it's just wildebeest, keep moving. Um, but this one here, it was literally last day on safari, we were driving along, and uh, this baby literally had just dropped from the mom. You can, if you look closely, see the umbilical cord that is hanging down there, um, and still wet. It was really cool to see that. And again, it's one of those things that you never know what you're gonna see, but really exciting to see it. This is uh, three monkeys. <laughs> this is in Costa Rica. This is uh, in, uh, I believe this is in Monteverde in Costa Rica. And the great thing is that the wildlife there, it's not scared of you, but they're definitely wild. They're not, you know, um, going to come up to you. Although in this case, sometimes they will beg. You do not want to feed them because then you ruin them. But they're there and they'll sit for you. And so I was able to get a shot like this, which honestly was one of my favorite photos from that. And I stood in a position where I knew that the sunlight was behind me showing through so I could get the light in their eyes, get that catch light in them. And this is a shot I did on my first trip to Tanzania with this zebra looking over the back of the other one. And I just like the, I just like the fact that the lines took you through the frame in an interesting way. So I'm thinking compositionally all the time that I'm shooting. Again, another mother and baby. This is from my last trip uh, to the rainforest, uh, the Osa Peninsula. And um, a lot of times, like, we will go out for all day and just looking for wildlife. But these are the howler monkeys that you hear. Uh, I mean, hear how many people have been to Costa Rica? Okay, and you've probably heard them. Crowd, you can hear these guys for miles, literally. Uh, sometimes they'll wake you up in the morning, and uh, so it was cool to get out and see them. And I actually shot this. I, I saw the mom cruising through looking, and I didn't even know that there was a baby there initially when I started shooting until later on we saw it, and then we sh shot some more. But again, I was pointing straight up from the road because we just take a vehicle out. You don't have to hike there at all. You just get out of the vehicle. When we, and you can tell when there's monkeys a lot of times just because if it's not very windy and there's leaves dropping on the road, that means you've got monkeys above you because they're disturbing the foliage. And that's what happened here. So we saw our, our guide saw some leaves. He hit the brakes, we got out, and this we saw and just pointed straight up. And a lot of times when we're shooting this, I'm teaching spot metering. And so if you use a valuative metering, which is standard setting for most cameras, it won't meter correctly because you have your bright sky and everything goes really dark. So one of the first things I teach when we're on tour is I teach everybody about spot metering and we spot meter on the face so that it's um, exposed correctly and we don't really care as much about the background. This is Synergy. <laughs> Um, yeah, these guys were, uh, we were invading their privacy, I guess you could say. Um, and, and the funny thing was, when we shot this, this is in the resort that we stay in the rainforest. So we stay in one resort the whole time, which is really nice and convenient because we go out for day trips and we don't have to move stuff. Um, and the, one of the guys actually speaks frog. 
And so he can make the sound and they'll answer him. It's the weirdest thing ever. And so he was able to like find these frogs under a leaf. And so they came and got us a dinner and they go, hey, we found these two frogs. So um, we had some little LED lights and this is me just holding a macro, the Canon 100 macro, which is, I should have mentioned, when we, whenever we go to the rainforest, I always have 100 macro. Um, and this is me holding it. And uh, I should have put the picture in there. Like we had three guides and my daughter all holding lights um, to get the shot because it was pitch black at the time in the night because they are nocturnal animals. But it's fun to get this. So just like any other photography, it's all about the light. If, if, as I mentioned earlier, there are times when we'll be driving along and you'll see a pack of lions and we see a lot of lions in Tanzania and you'll be like, keep driving. And the people are like, why? I go, well, and if they're an interesting pack, we'll stop and use our eyes and watch them. But photographically, there's times when it's just not a shot. And I actually coined an acronym that I yell out to all of our attendees. I'll say NASBIC, which is not a shot, but it's cool. <laughs> and so I, I kept saying that, and I coined NASBIC. So when we're on tour, there's times where I'll tell everybody to stop, and I'll just say NASBIC, and everybody knows, let's watch this pride of lions with our eyes, we don't need to take the photo, it's crappy light, but it's still fun to watch. And so, and this is something where people ask me all the time, like, should I bring my spouse? So of course, you're on safari. Whether you want to take a picture or not is your own prerogative, but you're seeing wildlife. And there are times when it's actually not a bad thing to put our camera down for a minute and just enjoy it for what it is. So, um, our, our guides tend generally know, and I tell them, this is what we're looking for. So as we're driving, I'll tell the driver, we're looking for stuff on the right side right now, or if we're going a different direction, I'll be now we're on the left. So let's look for animals on that side. But again, if there's something interesting, we want to stop either way. Um, there are times when actually using a flash outside will help, and a lot of people underestimate the power of a flash. Um, I've used a flash from hundreds of yards away, and it still makes a difference. So I'm going to show you some examples of that. Um, and portrait rules still do apply. So you want to focus on the eyes. You want to think about the lighting on the face. And so here's an example of kind of bad lighting. And this is in that uh, Safari West up in the Napa Valley area in California. And so they, they have them in kind of not cages, but you go through like a fence to go into each of their areas. And that was just, a, it, was a cool, it was cool to see it, but the lighting was horrible. Now inversely, the light on this bird, this is the same bird that you saw that I shot in the wild where they crisscrossed, and this is one that um, was actually in uh, Safari West. I was able to get nice and close, but the light was really neutral and worked to my advantage. This was taken on a pier off of Pier 39, uh, which is right near Fisherman's Wharf in San Francisco, and they've got a ton, ton of these guys, and the light was fine. It was nice and foggy, it was, as it is many times in, in the San Francisco area, and allowed me to get a little bit of sunlight on them, but still stay you know, without too many harsh shadows. This one here was one of my favorite shots from my first trip to Costa Rica, because this guy looks like he's guarding. He looks pissed off, is what he does. Yeah, it was pretty funny because I was just, uh, so I was shooting, this is with the older 100-400, which is not nearly as sharp as the new one, but still pretty good. But I was just waiting him out, and he kept moving on this branch, and then he moved to the spot and moved right into this light. And my first thought was, I better get this shot because the light was so perfect on him to allow me to light the head, you know, the face, the hands, and let everything else go dark. So that you, everybody here, when I switched this picture, laughed because they looked at the face first, because that's what's in focus, and that's what's in a good light. So lighting really does matter. So here, I always try to move, and I tell all the workshop attendees, if you have a shot with a bunch of sky in the background and it's really bright, that's not going to be good. Let's try to move to a position where we get trees behind us, because then our lighting's going to be better on the animal and our background's going to be less distracting. And the animals like this, where the monkey's got, this is a spider monkey who's got his tail wrapped and hanging down, so, the, so now I can go tail to the edge of the foot, and that's kind of my, my long shot. Taking, you know, it makes way more sense to shoot this vertically than horizontally. Now, I, I shoot a lot of sports. Uh, you know, I've done six Olympics, and so I'm used to shooting action. The same thing is true for wildlife. 
uh, you want to try to get good action shots and you have to be ready for them because you don't know a lot of times that it's going to happen. Now, in the case of the kill that we saw, we could predict it. Um, well, maybe we couldn't predict it, but our guides clearly could predict it. Um, but you want to keep your head up at all times and be ready for it. In this case, this was the kill. So what happened was, if you remember back a bunch of slides, all those zebras are by the water. We had two lionesses, actually, I think it was three, actually. No, two. There were two lionesses up by a tree in the shade. They like to hang out in the, in the shade. And they were low, crouched down low, and just watching. And our guides pulled up and said, wait, 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 we have to stop here. I think something's going to happen. And they could tell by the stance. Well, they waited for one of the wildebeest, this one here. There was one of the younger ones, and it was in the mud. So it wasn't going to be moving anywhere fast. And basically, they jumped up and ran, and all of it was like complete dust as every animal in the area ran for its life, literally. This, um, the only one lioness went for the kill, and this is actually only a two year old. The mom stayed back and just watched. She was teaching the two year old how to kill. So she stayed back, did not get involved at all. This is the cub that actually went underneath grabbed it, flipped it around, and then I thought it would go for the jugular, didn't. Actually put its head on top of uh, its mouth, over the mouth and nose of the wildebeest until it suffocated it. it. Took about 10 minutes. And the whole time we had pulled up in our vehicle, we were probably 10 feet away, and it just sat there looking at us like, how am I doing? <laughs> and, then, and then after that was done, and the wildebeest was dead, the, they didn't even eat because they don't miss opportunity. If they have opportunity, they'll take it and they'll get a kill and they'll wait and eat when they're hungry. So they were already full from another kill probably. And it went over to mom and mom gave it a kiss. I should have put that picture in here. Sorry I didn't. Um, it was like a reaffirmation of like, you did a great job. Just with a cub. And then, and then we never saw them eat. We, went back, we did wait for a while to see if a male or anybody else would come. They never did. We did find the carcass the next day. It had been dragged up away. But um, it was really interesting to watch and something that was uh, fascinating for everybody. But the peak of action, you know, the kill is something that's hard to predict and hard to shoot because you're moving quickly. This is actually just a yawn. And whenever we see packs of lions in decent light, you'll hear me in saying, come on, give us a good yawn, because then you get the teeth like this, which is really fun. And there's nothing more frustrating than being the photographer who's looking down at your camera, and then you look up and see the yawn, and you missed it. And you know, this is a hyena that are uh, fighting uh, or playing, depending how you look at it. And you could tell, remember before I told you you could tell when an animal's in a zoo because it's clean or not, this is what they look like in the wild. You know, they've got blood and guts and dirt, and that's just what's on them. <laughs> Peak of action, waiting for them to open their mouths. This is uh, quite common if it's really wet. The first year we went on safari in, in 16, very wet, and we had um, a lot of this. Next year we went, it was a drought, there was almost no water at all, and it was, like, there was, they were just dormant. There were no open mouths at all. But it was cool to catch that, so you had to be ready for it. You want to think about, cre like, creative composition. And again, I told you in the last presentation when I talked about shooting events, I like to be creative and try something different. When I shoot the Olympics, I try to do motion panning and do it different. Because I th that's what's interesting to me, especially if you have a 1,000 other photographers at the Olympics, how I shoot something differently. So I'm always looking in all directions. There's times when everybody's over here looking at the lion. I'm like, uh, there's a cool elephant right here. So I'm always looking around. I'm shooting up. I'm shooting down. I'm thinking about my aperture. Um, but you want to be aware of your entire surroundings. In this case, I really wanted to be aware of my surroundings because I was in the water <laughs> when I shot this. So I was standing. Um, uh, this is right at the resort. We stayed at a place called Crocodile Bay. Um, there was no, I wasn't in any danger. Um, they're well fed, but I did get to the point where it was about 10 feet from me. I kept shooting with a 100, 400 until I felt like I got my shot and then I just backed up. But uh, it was fun to get the shot anyway. This was taken in captivity, so what do I do? I turn around and I shoot up. Because now I just have sky and trees, um, so you don't see all the man made stuff or even tighter if I want to, 
to try to show even more of just the face. Or sometimes I'll get creative and I won't even try to get the face and I'll maybe just focus just on the patterns in, in, the, in, in, in what they have to offer there. And there's some amazing patterns in the wild. And even something like this, this is in Costa Rica, there's times I've shot macro shots of just the eye and the wing and not even the whole butterfly. So there's things like that that you can do to have some fun and try something different. In this case, I was shooting really tight. Sometimes I'll shoot wider. And you know, in the previous shot, all I have is greenery. Here I had some flowers, so I thought, okay, I'll include that and I'll go rule of thirds and change it up. So as I'm shooting, I'm always shooting vertically, horizontally, trying different things. <laughs> and when I'm teaching, I'm telling people that. Try getting this in focus, try doing this. You know, try some different things. Get underneath the leaf. So <laughs> this is one of my favorite shots from my first trip to Costa Rica. And we, this was, I'm laying on the dirt on the ground because this is about maybe a couple feet over the ground. If you looked at it from the top, it's like, yep, there's a lizard on a leaf. It was fun to shoot, but it wasn't much. But when I looked underneath, and I took the time to look down and look underneath, I'm like, that's kind of cool. Because now I have the silhouette of the body. Luckily enough, I had him peeking out over the leaf. If I didn't have the, him peeking out of the leaf, it wouldn't be as interesting. And then I've got the tail going all the way up that leaf. So again, by taking the time to actually creatively get underneath it, it's a different shot than just, okay, here's a lizard. Or just looking at the back of a bird to get patterns. And in this case, you know, composing so that I, um, this is at Ngorgo Crater, and I actually had the driver move back so that we could get the mountains in the distance behind him. So we had gone too low and all I have was sky. And I said, can you back up a little bit to, go, again, go rule of thirds, get some good sunlight on him, but include the background, but not have the background be too much in focus. And uh, on, in the first trip to Tanzania, we had this cheetah that was resting. And I said to everybody in, the, in our group, if that thing walks to the left, we're going to have this background all, which is hundreds of yards in the distance, to allow us to get a good shot focusing just on the animal and having everything blurred in the background if we were shooting at f4, f5, 6, which is what we did. And, and it did. It got up and walked to the left. It was just perfect. Most of the time when I'm shooting tree frogs, I'm shooting really close, like that other shot that you saw. And so on this last trip, we had this one, and I thought, well, it's okay to shoot tight. I've done that already. I had some tight shots. How to do something differently. So again, I switched. This is on tripod. So I switched to a vertical view, and I went right to the edge of the leaf and shot down the leaf and made sure that the frog was the only thing in focus. Again, just to try something differently and using that aperture to my advantage. This is again in Costa Rica. One of the cool things there that we can do is uh, they have bird feeders all around the property that we stay. So even on our off days, if we're not on, you know, out looking for wildlife, we'll sit down and have a beer with our tripods in hand and wait for the birds to come by and then we can isolate them like this. And so again, shooting at F4, we can get the animal perfectly in focus, blur that background, try to avoid the bright light. You'll notice I moved to a point where the bird was completely green behind it so I didn't have that white spot going right through their head. So I'm thinking about my foreground and background all the time when I'm shooting. As I mentioned, these are the filters that I use the most, are the ND filters, um, and you can use them in different ways. So obviously a UV filter is more just to protect your lens, um, but the circular polarizer is great for pulling colors. Um, and also for shooting, if anytime you're shooting water, so uh, waterfalls, lakes, rivers, I always have a circular polarizer on my camera. Um, so here's an example. Uh, in Tanzania, this was, of course, during the wet time. You can tell because it's so green. This is that cheetah shot that you saw where it had walked across that area. This was on the flip side of that. We had pulled down in this green area, and everybody was still watching the cheetah to the right. And I said to everybody in the group, look to your left. Look how beautiful. And you'll see the light spots. It was wind blowing through this field. And it was just beautiful. And, um, and so using the polarizer allowed me to bring the greens and the blues of the sky out 
really made a big difference. The other thing you can use is an ND filter, which is basically cuts the light out of your lens so that you can slow your shutter speed down. So in this case, if I'm trying to motion pan um, the wildebeest as they're running through migration, I, I can't do this at 500th of a second. I want this to be at like 30th of a second or 40th of a second, which if I have a really bright day doesn't work. So I have to put an ND filter on there in order to basically darken down what the lens is bringing in to allow me to slow the shutter speed down. And that's what I used here. Um, Finding great color, and this is something I am attracted to color. I love color. Um, I always tell my wife, she says, what do you think of this outfit? I said, I need brighter, make it brighter. Like, I love bright colors. Uh, in Tanzania, even the lizards are cool. Um, and this is, uh, there's one spot that I, these lizards just hang out, so I know they're there. And so um, this is on, we stop, it's really weird, so Serengeti, literally means endless plains, endless flat plains. And the drive through the Serengeti is like three or four hours of driving and you see amazing migration and stuff, but it's just literally flat, dirt roads. But halfway through, there's a mound that goes up and that's where you uh, do your paperwork to uh, enter into, uh, in and out of Serengeti. And um, if you climb a little hill there, there's all these lizards. So I took the group while we were waiting for paperwork. I said, follow me. And we went up there and shot these lizards and I love the colors. because just And that's not Photoshopped. That's just naturally like that. And even the birds there, and I'm not a birder, it's funny, I used to make fun of people that did birding, uh, or bird photography, and now I totally get it. Um, it's really fun to do, and there's some incredible species. Um, this was in Africa, this was uh, also in Africa, and um, to watch these in the wild is really fun as they're nesting and building their nests, really cool. This is taken in Costa Rica, and it's interesting to me because when you, the, one of the first pictures I showed you was the hummingbird in my backyard. Now in California, we have a lot of hummingbirds, but they're not this color. And so I was pretty blown away when I saw the colors here. One of the tricks for shooting uh, birds like this is to use your flash. Um, so what I did here is I, uh, I made sure the shutter speed wasn't too fast because I wanted to get the blur of the wings. And the wings of a hummingbird are so fast that even at a hundredth or two hundredth of a second, you'll still get a lot of blur. Um, but I use the flash uh, for two reasons. One is to help freeze the bird a little bit to get it sharp, but also that's what brings the color out in the feathers. So, um, so I was shooting, again, watching my background, but shooting it with the flash to pull that, and um, still one of my favorite shots. Not, and I, I didn't predict that the tongue would be coming out, but it worked. This uh, was taken um, in Costa Rica, again, in the rainforest. And um, I love this shot because it's almost like the frog's going like, okay, enough pictures, <laughs> stop. Because we've been shooting for a while, and I, I was in like, okay, I got it, you're good. Did you get your shot? Um, but I love the colors of the feet and how that works against the blue, the green, the red. I mean, it, it still astounds me, the colors that are in nature. The, I mean, I mean it, it just blows my mind. This is shot in the last trip where he's looking right at me. And I really like that, a straight on shot versus a side shot. And you really see the eyes there. And again, just like portraits, I tend to focus on the eyes. Uh, for most of these shots, I'm on a tripod. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm generally shooting at things like F11. Because if you're shooting at 2.8 or F4, not enough is in focus. This is um, also in Costa Rica. And um, this thing was uh, very easy to shoot because he just kind of sat there and waited for me. I shot this one handheld and just kind of waited him out. Uh, again, focusing on the eyes and the face, I don't really care if the rest of the body was out of focus. As long as the, most of the face is in focus, I was totally good with that. Now, as I mentioned, th these are nocturnal animals. So in Costa Rica, uh, we were sitting in the resort and our same frog whisperer found a frog again. And it's cool because he just took it on the leaf and he brought it over to us. And he actually jumped on my Gitzo tripod at one point. But um, he was on this flower and again we were using LED lights and we were just holding, me and another guy who stayed up late that night just got some lights and we just started shooting and having fun. 
This is, as I was telling you, when we were drinking our beers and just hanging out and shooting the birds in Costa Rica. Again, what I did here is I, I, I purposely was looking at where the birds were constantly landing, and I went to a place that had the branch at an angle, so it kind of take you through the frame, and waited for the different color birds to land. And, I, and, and basically, I was waiting for a really cool shot of the blue color bird, and then I'd try to focus on one of the yellow ones, then I'd wait for one of the red ones, and so I'm trying to get each of the species and get a nice tight shot. Actually, this is how we start uh, each Costa Rica trip now, because it's a great way to practice all the things that we'll be utilizing during the week. One of the things that you want to do is listen to the experts. Again, it doesn't matter if you're listening to a zookeeper in a zoo, the ra a ranger at a park, or the guides. They have a lot of amazing information, not just about getting a good shot, but also just about the animals and their characteristics. So. Um, I, I can tell you the guides make or break a trip. So uh, whether you're going, uh, I know I was talking to someone who said they're going to Botswana um, next month, and as we are, but they're not going with us. But it doesn't matter, the guide is gonna make or break that trip. So you wanna make sure you have good guides. Because they're the ones, we've had, I've had guides, we're driving 40 miles an hour down a road and they hit the brakes, I'm like, what did you see? And they said, there's a dung beetle on the ground, I'm like, how did you see that at 40 miles an hour? <laughs> it's incredible. They see things and they also know what to look for. Like I said, they look for leaves coming off trees to know that there's wildlife above us. They know the characteristics of the animals. They also know an elephant, depending on how their ears are, whether they should be staying or, or do we need to back up and get out of the way kind of thing. And so they know all that stuff, but they also, they'll tell you a ton of information. Um, Again, but they're also smart enough to know to help you in your photographs because they're going to be able to predict things and, and say, I think they're moving in this direction. Or I've even had them say, I think there's a lion nearby. And I'm just like, why, why would you say that? And he goes, well, do you notice how the other animals are all moving in one direction and looking back? I mean, they, they sm they're smelling something. Like, they know all this. So having good guides is really the key to getting good photos. I always have a slide in almost every presentation that says, push yourself. Because every time I shoot, I want to push myself. Um, because the fact that I'm ADD and I want to get something different every time, but I like to challenge myself as much as I can. So I try shooting off angle, or um, I'll try the burst mode and shoot more images than maybe I need to. Or I'll try motion panning, which is something I did on the last trip. And this is probably my favorite photo I've ever taken on a safari, probably because it was the hardest shot I've ever taken. And this is at 560 millimeters, handheld at 40th of a second. So it's very hard to do. Um, and I was panning from a vehicle. Um, we had stopped the vehicle. I was in it, though. And I was uh, moving the lens at the exact same speed as the zebra. And what really made this shot, this is like on the second day of our trip. And I'm like, well, I can go home now. Um, but having all of the feet off the ground, all the hooves off the ground at the same time, with really great motion in the legs and the feet, and a little bit in the tail, but not in the face. And then, of course, the blur, because I'm shooting that motion uh, blur, I don't have any of the background that's sharp and in focus. And this is still one of my favorite photos. But I'll try something different, just like this one here. This is a pack of zebra that were all running together. And so I'm like, all right, I'll try panning that. Some people love this image, and some people don't. But you know, photography is subjective. So you know, I'll take it and try it. I like it. Um, so I keep it. This one here, um, I was pushing myself because it was raining and I wasn't sure I wanted to get out of the vehicle because it was raining. And we saw this hawk and I'm like, oh, let's go over there and shoot that. And I was with some people and we were shooting it. And um, because it was wet, it actually worked to our advantage. So when people say to me, well, but wait, it's the rainforest. And it says on the forecast, it rains every day. Well, it does rain every day, but when you go to Hawaii, it says rain every day, it rains for 10 minutes and then stops. So usually it rains late in the afternoon, by then we're done. In this case, it was raining all day. I said, ah, let's, go out, let's go out and shoot a little bit anyway. So we took a risk. If it wasn't for the rain, I wouldn't have gotten this. It was literally, the hawk was sitting on a branch, we're all shooting it, and then at that split second, it just did that little shake to get the water off its wings, and that's what I got. 
Um, and so you have to, you know, when I talked to you before about being ready for the unexpected and the peak of action, I was not expecting that. Actually, no one else got the shot because everybody was looking down to see if they were in focus. So one of those things you want to keep your eye up and keep shooting. Again, some of my favorite photos. And here's the list of the different tours that we're doing. Um, so next month we're in Namibia, and then Botswana. Uh, then we're going to Costa Rica right after that, like two weeks after I get back from Botswana, we'll head down to the rainforest. Um, and I have that sold out, but I think we actually may have one or two spots open, because we just had an opening on that. And then we're going to Europe, to Croatia, Slovenia. Then we're going to Tanzania. So the Tanzania, January, February, as I mentioned, is the one with the calving. That's the reverse migration. Um, and then back to Costa Rica again for the rainforest, and then we go to Tanzania for the actual migration. And that's where they tend to go more through crossings of the river and stuff like that. And then we have India in 2020. So a lot going on there. This is how you get a hold of me. Um, the website's jeffcable.com. I do have a page on there with a lot of my sponsors who have deals for all of you, so check that out. Um, we can get like 10 or 20% off products. Um, my blog is blog.jeffcable.com. I blog every week. Um, from the Olympics, I blog once or twice a day. Typically, though, it's once a week. When I'm on Safari, I generally can't blog because the internet's not really that good in, in uh, Africa. So I generally blog after I get home. But I, I do push to social media at least one image a day if I can. Um, so, um, but Jeff, uh, Jeff at jeffcable.com is my email address. If you have any questions, you can ask and I answer all my emails. Facebook and Instagram is Jeff Cable Photography, and Twitter uh, is just jcable12. So, all right, tell you what, so in the time frame here, if anybody here has questions, feel free to ask me. I'll stick around and answer any. For everybody online, thank you, and uh, email me if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you.